Ever since I started crafting buildings, crafting ruins, crafting castles, I've wanted to build Minas Tirith. But I don't have enough space and I'm just not that crazy. But I do know someone who is. Ah, you do it. That's right, today's video is a collaboration with the mighty Zorbasorb, who for the last year or so has been embarking on the most insane international hobby community collaboration, a true scale Minas Tirith gaming board. Lockie set out on his mission to recreate the greatest city in Middle-earth, an undertaking that no mere mortal would be insane enough to attempt on its own. The mission was simple, yet infinitely complex. Build Minas Tirith in as close to film set accuracy as possible, whilst also leaving artistic license to facilitate the ultimate tabletop Middle-earth strategy battle game gaming experience. Having undertaken such a massive project, Lockie enlisted the help of the wider crafting YouTube community, and when Zorbasorb calls for aid, YouTube answers. The first season of this project completed last year, the beacons have somehow reached my own little corner of Middle Earth here at Nat1 Videos with a conscription to build a strategium tower for one of the lower levels of Minas Tirith. But before I start building my contribution to the project, I think it's time to make like an end and leave. Things are starting to get a little bit hairy. When I asked Lucky what I should build, he told me there was some wiggle room with the screen accuracy caveat, so I decided to take inspiration from the Gondorian structures in the Edge of the Ring computer game and build this towering octagonal structure. The first part of the process was figuring out the footprint of the building from a basis of having 2.5 cm thick outer walls at the base of the building that get progressively smaller as the tiers go higher into the structure. Not too complex, but straight away I encountered the problem of including buttresses on each corner. My first inclination was to cut away the corners of the building once glued and then add the buttresses to the outside, but my good friend and all-round wizard of foam crafting, Gerard Boom from Shifting Lands, suggested that instead of gluing my walls corner to corner, I should slot in some 2cm sections of foam for the buttresses, which would maintain the structural integrity and give much more realistic looking buttresses. Thanks Gerard, you are a legend. Okay, so I have my eight sections of wall ready to start the top tier of the build. All I have to do now is to cut the sides at the right angle to make a perfect octagon. For anyone who's curious about the math, the exact angle I'm cutting off each side of the foam is 22.5 degrees, which should result in a perfect octagon, in theory. For the gradient on the outside of the buildings, I just went with an angle that felt about right and maintained that same angle throughout each tier of the build. I often see people using hot glue when it comes to gluing their foam together, but I have found that using wood glue and pinning a far more effective method. Hot glue sets really quickly, leaving you with very little time to reposition any pieces that are not fitting quite as they should. For the purposes of trying to make things a little more clear for you guys in my video, I'm using a darker colour foam for the buttress sections. One thing that's not so clear from the footage is that all of these cuts I'm making here are completely useless. Because I made the top tier of the build far too small to fit in three of the iconic V-shaped battlements at the top. So I had to scrap this top tier all together and make a bigger bottom tier from scratch. No! No! Right, last night while I was hanging out on Discord with some of my Patreon members, I managed to make all of the cuts for the bottom tier of the build and I've dry fit it so that it's all held in place. I also glued on some jigs for the doors and that's all ready for the next step. So I'm gonna unpin this and let's get cracking. Honestly, I don't know how many times I pinned, unpinned and repinned this building. With regular structures like square buildings, you can normally get away with pinning and gluing everything once and you are done. But with more complex structures, there is a larger risk of human error. A few degrees out at the beginning of a build can lead to big discrepancies much further down the line. So yeah, dry fitting your buildings really is your best friend when it comes to foam crafting. It does take a little longer, but you will be glad that you did in the end. It also helps you avoid frustrations like this, having to carve away my big arches on the previous bottom tier, which is now the new middle tier. If I had dry fit this section instead of gluing it all straight away, fixing this problem would have been a lot simpler. The other trick that was a bit of a game changer for me when I started was gluing cardboard jigs to make all of your detailed cuts. I use a spray adhesive which sets really quickly and it just means that you can make accurate cuts every time rather than freehanding it. 
Now, the whole time I was building this tower, I was coming from a pretty ingrained mindset of building for D&D, with a little voice in the back of my head saying, make it a playable interior. But when I mentioned this to Lockie, he said, don't be a daft plum, this is Middle Earth strategy battle game. So yeah, I scrapped that idea. However, I did at least want to make some kind of feature out of the inside of the tower, because you can see through the arches. It would just look weird as an empty building. This is where the shape cutter from Shifting Lands comes in incredibly handy, enabling you to cut your desired shape perfectly every time. Crap. The central columns cut, I was able to start to carve in the brickwork, which I will also replicate on the outside walls. Then once again, dry fit everything together and finally give this thing a little bit of a strength test. As you can see, the addition of the central column doesn't act just as a visual feature, but it's going to add a ton of strength and durability to the structure. I'm not saying that you could kick this thing around, but it's certainly going to hold up to any abuse it might encounter on the gaming table. One little correction that I have to make, this was originally the bottom tier and I had these extra little buttresses on the bottom so I'm going to have to cut those off and then I'm going to have to re-angle this. So I'm going to make a little cardboard jig so that I get those angles cut correctly. <sighs> that initial mistake that I made with the top tier at the beginning really did end up costing me a few days extra work in catch up. Not a huge problem, but at the time we were running to an earlier release date of November and I was starting to run over at this point. Gladly, Lucky changed the initial plan and decided to release in December instead, which took the pressure off. It also gave me some extra time to put a little more focus into the detail of the build. All of these techniques I'm showing like gluing extra trim and also pressing individual bricks into the foam to create an uneven layered effect are super easy, but they do add a ton of depth to your build and look really good. They just take loads of time, but better to take your time and not be too hasty. Hasty? Our friends are out there. They need our help. Okay, okay, I better crack on with this build then. Still a boatload of windows to add and a ton of texturing still to do. All of the MDF woodwork and doors I use in this build come from Shifting Lands. I will leave a link for you guys in the description below so you can pick some up for yourself. Honestly, I've never spent this much time adding detail and texture to one building. With the brickwork, as always, I first carved in the pattern with a sharp knife, then widened the gaps with a pencil, and of course, it wouldn't be a legit foam crafted building without the use of the old faithful tinfoil ball. Gotta make sure to get into all of those little nooks and crannies, because when the washes go down later on, you will notice and all of those micro details will really add another level of realism. And of course, as with the central columns, I spent a considerable amount of time compressing individual bricks to give that uneven texture to the brickwork. Again, well worth the extra time and effort. I then carved out all of the windows using a hot knife foam cutter. Before tackling the first true bane of the build, because there is a second bane, individually gluing and cutting out mesh for 48 individual windows that will adorn the outside walls of the build. I stuck my fingers together so many times during this process that my fingertips actually felt like sandpaper for a week after this. I've actually noticed that some of the other buildings within the Minus Tirith collaboration actually use these same window designs, so it was a happy little accident to be able to tie in with some of the other architecture within the project. And finally, after gluing all of those into the wall of the structure, I was on to the second and most tedious bane of the build, hundreds of tiny individual foam shingles. This was a little more complicated than normal as I had to cut several different sizes because I was gluing them to a polystyrene dome. With the dome, as you go higher up, the space that you're working with decreases so you can't just offset the shingles as you would do on a flat roof. You have to make size adjustments all the way to the top. And by the time I got to the top, well quite frankly I couldn't quite figure out how to finish it off so I kind of cheated by carving a nice little disc of foam to top the whole thing off. I could have probably gotten away with just saying that was on purpose. The trim around the walkways and the tops of the buttresses however were much easier using a one size fits all approach. Handy tip for placing foam shingles on is to use a toothpick. This sped things along considerably and then all that was left to do was piecing the structure together. Honestly, when I got to this stage of the build, I was getting quite excited. I could see the shape and the structure of the build coming together, but there was still quite a bit of work left to do. Finally, onto the paint job. I'm gonna be trying to tie in as much as I possibly can with Lockie's aesthetic. So he's got an awesome painting tutorial on how to do stonework on his channel. I'll leave a link in the description below for that video. 
and yeah I'm going to be following that as closely as possible which does mean that this is the first time I am going to be using a white base coat for my stonework normally I do a black base coat and yeah because I like that darker aesthetic but first time for everything also I'm going to have to paint this in separate pieces before I glue it all together otherwise I'm just not going to be able to get in around and paint in between all of the pillars etc let's get it done So, so pleased with how this build has turned out. The paint job really tied it together and I just think it looks awesome. Lockie's tutorial on how to do minus tear stonework is spot on. I'm still not finished with the build yet. I definitely want to take it one step further. I know I'm delaying things slightly, but I'm going to add some lights to the inside. Hopefully I can get it done today and then just get this all sent off tomorrow. But you know what they say. Overkill is underrated, my friend. If you're interested in learning how to put electronics and lights into your terrain, then I highly suggest you check out my friend David over at Terraintronics. Not only does he have some excellent tutorials on his YouTube channel, but he also sells all of the electronic products that I use in my builds in his online shop. With this build, I ended up using 16 individual flicker LED lights, which were all wire wrapped to three separate Castle Conway boards. And then to trigger the lights, a reed switch, which means I can turn them all on and off simultaneously by the use of a magnet. I then used some medieval looking sconces, which were also designed by David. Once it was all wired up, I was finally at the very last hurdle of gluing the entire completed project together. With just one very last detail, a magnet in the base of the dome, and you will see why just in a second. Okay, moment of truth. Let's see if this whole thing works. So in theory, I should be able to twist this and the lights will turn on. Bing! Yes! It works. Awesome. Just while some of these final shots are playing, I want to say a massive thanks to Lockie for inviting me to be part of this epic project. Truth be told, I was really kind of hoping to be involved, so yeah, I'm over the moon. There were also some other amazing collaborators involved this time around, and I have linked a playlist in the description below so you can check out all of their videos, and of course, Lockie's video on Zorbazorb, where you can see all of the builds come together. Guys, thank you so much for taking the time to check out my build. I really would appreciate your subscription if you've enjoyed this video. And of course, a little like and a comment would go a long, long way. Ask me anything if any part of the build was not clear. And of course, this video was made possible by my wonderful patrons. You guys are the best, and I'm really looking forward to hanging out with you all over on Discord very soon, now that I have finally completed this project. Thanks again, and until next we meet, Nalaway Govanadvin. Vin.